Good afternoon, everyone. So um, you can hear me right and see my screen. So we, uh, we're going to have one tutorial today. I combined the two, the two tutorials after me in the one right now together because we already have seen uh, the full stack development in week zero. So uh, with, with demo, uh, it's just a repeated tutorial. Here, I'm just going to show you what are the best practices you can implement in your API design and front-end development. Additional information to, to better your performance on these regards. But if you, uh, and by now you guys all have an experience of building backend and frontend with React. Uh, but if you need also the tutorial, you can go back and see the full stack development because we have seen these two concepts with a demo before. So let's just now go to the concepts and the references you should read up on to improve your skills on this regard. So when it comes to API design, let's start from there. Uh, as you know, uh, you need to have a good API. A good API requires uh, careful planning and a good understanding of the underlying pro process uh, and technology. What I mean by that is uh, you, when you design your REST API, there's a lot of tools you can use. You can use Fast API, you can use Swagger, you can use Flask, you can use Django if you are using Python. For Norge, there are a lot of frameworks that you can use depending on the language and there are a lot of frameworks that are available out there for you designing your api so you have to understand you have to choose you will choose probably one particular tool to build your api design and you have to understand th that tool to have a good uh, api design because each tool has its own different structure they give the same result at the end but they have different way of doing things so you have to understand the particular technology you are using for creating your REST API. So, um, okay. So, a well, uh, an API design is a process of creating well defined API interfaces that allow us to connect two software components and interact with each other. Front end and back end, we make a connection between these two software components using our REST uh, our API. So, we have to design them carefully uh, and a well-designed API should be able uh, should be easy for other developers to read it so how you name your REST APIs your REST URLs also matters as a professional for example last time you guys have used the Redash uh, APIs right they have released uh, written documentation on it so it can be accessed by other developers and if you so, so see those URLs or Redash, they are easy to understand. Any developer can understand them. So as a professional, if you are working in the area of designing REST API, uh, API you have to also consider it is it's going to be readable by other developers because they are the likely users that's going to be accessing the REST API if you put it in an open source uh, code, that is. I mean, you don't have to worry about that for now, but as a professional level, and like Rudash is, if they, if your company or whatever your project you're doing, this you decided to share your REST APIs for other developers to use it for their purpose, it should be easy for other developers to read. So you have to consider all these things when you design your API. So what are the key steps or stages that you should include or you should go when you design your API? So you start from gathering requirements. That is, what, for what purpose are you planning the REST API for? So you have to understand the use case that you are trying to uh, create a REST API for because it will help you to design your API better. And like me, I mentioned before, you also have to know information about the tool you are using. This is the first step you have to do. You have to gather all the requirements for and understand them for uh, the first step when you design your API. The second step would be your endpoint definition, which is uh, these endpoints are the URLs that are going to be accessed by clients to access your resources, whatever resources you have on your database, on your Viking code, 
these URLs are the one a user will access. So you have to put a definition for each endpoint where each endpoint is doing, what kind of information are they retrieving or storing, whatever the purpose of that endpoint is, you have to have a defined definition for that endpoint. The second, the third one would be data modeling. Data modeling uh, is a critical concept you need to include in your API design. So if you, I don't know how many of you know frameworks like uh, frameworks that follow the MVC architecture, that is model, view, and control. Uh, this architecture, uh, the, the, for example, Laravel, uh, Node.js, uh, Django, I'm sure they also follow this MVC structure. They give you these folders or layers to uh, divide your tasks when you build your REST API. So on the modeling part of the folder, the folder they give you, their formulas give you when, you know, when you install them, they give you this modeling section only. And on that modeling section, you define all your database uh, schemas. So you don't you don't define them on your REST API functions. Instead, on the modeling part only, you will define your tables format, what kind of table you have, what is the data type of that table. Uh, maybe I can show you Energos application which does this. For example, um, I have this Node.js application here. So when you install Node.js, for example, uh, almost, almost all of them has the same structure. This is the modeling part. They give you this folder to create only your models. Here, I'm defining what my user table looks like. I, I'm connecting this MongoDB here. I'm defining my models for my, my database away from the REST API functionality. So all the when the models are separating from uh, the REST API, the endpoint accessing function, it will be it will not be vulnerable to, to, to be accessed by other attackers. So it will be hidden. So the better your schemas are hidden from the endpoint, how the endpoint uh, the endpoint, the secure it will be your endpoint. So there are options where your endpoint not only access your function, but you can also define your schemas there. That's not advisable. Having your schemas for the table, the module part separate from the REST API is much better uh, when you design your API. So you, it is a critical condition that can lead to your API being secure at the end. So you're, uh, you should have a separate data modeling for your tables that are uh, that's going to be stored on the database. That is where, what is the concept behind data modeling. Uh, the fourth step you have to consider would be security. How secure are your endpoints? So not all your endpoints should be accessed by all your users. Some, some, your, some of your endpoints should be only accessed by users and some of them by admins. And, not all, and none of them should be accessed by users that are not members of your application. So you have to set that kind of authentication on your endpoints. Who is who, who should have access to access this particular endpoint who shouldn't have. So to make that kind of security limitations on uh, your endpoints, you need to have an authentication mechanism. So to apply, apply this authentication mechanism on your endpoint, there are two, there are a lot of tools that you can use. The OZ, the, J, the JWT, this is a popular uh, token for authentication mechanism. So these are all packages that you install and apply on your REST APIs to secure and to decide who should have access to access your particular endpoint. So you have to consider security for your endpoints. The fifth one would be error handling. As you all know, error handling is an important functionality to include in any REST API, in any function, uh, that excuse something because uh, the a proper if you have a proper hand handling the user engagement with a, a user with your application will be smooth because if an error is occurred a developer will get a message about a particular error and it will give it a chance it will give the developer a chance to quickly fix that error because it nowhere happens based on what kind of error message it gets 
so the maintenance part when you have an error handling mechanism the flow of your application will be sm uh, smooth the maintenance part of fixing that particular error for a developer would be easily recognizable so they can fix it quickly and your application will back to work if you don't have error handling you wouldn't know when some error happened on your application you wouldn't know where it exists you, it will you take you time to figure out where it happened and fix it if you don't have error handling but with error handling uh, a lot of the, your performance of your application will be much bigger so this is a must to include on your rest apis uh, the other would be documentation so at this stage on this project you might not have you might not to worry about documentation but as a professional level documentation is necessary for rest your all your APIs, what are their purpose, what kind of parameter they expect, what kind of query they that does expect on the URL. So this kind of information, uh, you have to have some kind of documentation for your REST APIs. This is a, a good practice to have when you design your REST API. Uh, again, I'm going to mention the Redash documentation. So they have a proper documentation for REST APIs, right, indicating what each REST API requires and what kind of output to expect. So this kind of information uh, is what we call documentation. If you have a group, if you should have a well documented, documented uh, information about your REST API. The seventh one would be testing. So as any application, testing also required in a professional REST API. So you make you have to make sure before putting it to production or uh, your REST APIs are working as they should. Uh, by, by this means, I'm not saying only testing it on tools like Postman. You have to have a code on your uh, backend on your REST API that checks all the time you re if your endpoints are working as they should. And these testing tools, you can use PyTest for Python REST APIs. You can, uh, depending on the frame of the tool or the technology you are using to build those REST APIs. Also, there are other libraries that you can use to create a testing for your REST APIs. For example, Fast API has their own uh, tool that lets you test uh, the, the REST API that you create on Fast API, which can refer on the documentation. I'm sure Flask and Django, whatever the Python framework technology are using to build REST API, they can have their own built-in testing mechanism for testing REST APIs. But uh, the concept is you have to have a testing for your endpoint. That is, you should include testing on your API design. The things one would be versioning. Versioning, as you know, we when we have by now we install a lot of applications, right? We see version this app or open ai this is there's a version a lot of version for open ai for panda there is a lot of versions that are published we can access any version that we want and use it so all the version work so the concept behind versioning is the before versions still work user can access the old versions the well, whoever is the creator of the particular package is not removing the older versions that they can still access it but if you have some new changes that you want to apply on your package, in this case on your REST API, you will create a new version instead of removing the former one. That way you will not lose your users. Your application will not be hold until you fix, uh, you finish with your new REST API functionality because uh, they can use the older one. Still, you can create a new endpoint as uh, saying version two or another name and you can move on. So uh, this uh, gives a seamless or smooth interaction with your users. So this is also advisable to have. If you have a change in the endpoint functionality, you should apply versioning instead of removing the first one or holding your application until you fix it. You can create, uh, come up with versioning strategies. Uh, we will see a demo how you can do versioning with past API, but at the, uh, I'm sure you understand the concept behind versioning. Uh, the other concept you should include on your REST API design would be filtering and pagination. So let's say I want to list all my users from a database, which I can do. So, but if you have a thousand of database, 
Paging all those users to your application will take time, storage. So instead of doing that, if that's uh, something that a user required, okay, that you can do that, you can give that option. But instead of do doing that, you can uh, include another options called filtering and pagination. Filtering will give you, will give when you uh, put a filtering mechanism on your REST API endpoint, you will give the, your users to include uh, for example, users who are registered on the date of Sunday. So they can pass a date, pick a date on their front end user interface. You will pass that data to the, your endpoint, and your endpoint will only fetch you the data registered on that particular date. Instead of fetching every user, you will filter those that are required. So that will uh, increase your performance, your application, and that will be much better. And pagination is deciding the limit of how much data you are uh, retrieving from the backend. Uh, let's say if you can see a lot of application, you see an better, better, right? So when you click next, 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 a lot of uh, data will be fetched from a backend with some limit. So uh, for example, 10 rows, if 10 rows are listed, on the first uh, try, when you click next, you will find the next 20 trainees. I mean, uh, team, the next um, 10 users from your table, from your database. When you click the next, you will see another 10 rows from your database. So this is called pagination. You're limiting the number of uh, users that are going to be fetched from your database by calling the pagination functionality. So you will uh, pagination and filtering, this is just algorithms that you have to specify how the data should be fetched on your REST uh, API application. So you should implement those things. So for some mind that we want only the first 10 users, so pagination will give you that option. So this just make your REST API and your interaction, your front-end interaction with user more smooth and fast. Uh, the 12th concept would be item potent, where this concept is very critical to include in your application, actually it's a must. Uh, so what the idea is behind this concept is, uh, no, much, no matter how many times I'm calling your REST API endpoint, it should, be, it should give me the same result. So if I click, uh, your endpoint that leads me to fetch users, that particular endpoint always should be able to fetch only the user's table. It should not have miscommunication in fetch. If I have another table that for chat or message, it should not go overboard and fetch another table. So when you create your algorithm, you have to be careful. Your particular endpoint should always result the same result. So if I delete a function, let's say from a table, if I delete the first user with ID number one, it's deleted in the first try. So if I could again repeat that process again, again asking it to delete uh, the user with ID number one, it should throw not found error. That is the right way. Instead, if it goes to the second user, the third user and keep deleting it, I haven't implemented the item potent algorithm on it. There's an error. Uh, it might be, easy concept, but there are cases where, because they didn't apply this kind of uh, algorithm, the algorithm when they create their, I, their REST API, they have lost a lot of money. Instead of stopping in the first try, it keep continuing to the next, the second row, the third row, and they, delete, they lose their, all their data and they lose money. This is a case that really happened. So you have to be careful. Your endpoints should have uh, a condition. So it, it should, they should realize the same result. If for, if for the delete, if I delete the ID number one, when I do the second time, when I ask it to delete that particular user, it should create not found because it already deleted the first time. It should not go to ID number two and delete my second user, my third. So this kind of coding errors can result a lot of uh, failure on your application. So you have to give attention when you write your code. So these are the 
12 points I want to mention when you design API design. So uh, I believe they can be helpful if you apply them. And if you have any question, you can draw this. You should include when you design your API to access data from a database. Now let's go to React. So uh, you already guys know how you can install React and start coding to build a user interface. But to make your coding quality better, uh, your module organization better in React, uh, I'm going to give you some pointers. So all the points that I mentioned here uh, are not the only ones. There's a lot of things that you can do to improve your React application, which I shared a resource at the end that I'm going to mention here uh, the few ones. So there is this export bar concept to uh, make your module organization react a lot much better. So I'm going to show you this concept with an example. So the expar uh, export viral concept, what it does is, uh, this is a React application. This is a React application. I have a components folder. I have a page folder. Uh, if you have additional folders, which you can do, what you will do to apply this concept is in every uh, folder that you divided, you will create an index to JS if you are using JavaScript with React. Uh, if you are using TypeScript, you will create an index to TS file. So in my components folder, in my page folder, I have an index.js file. This is file. So let's just fetch this file. If I go to the my index components folder, I have this one. In my page, I have the same uh, file, index.js file. So once you create this file, you can make sure all your imports have a lot of components here. I have a lot of components that have different functionalities. I export all of them in one file in my index.js JS file. So if I want to access my footer, for example, my footer component in my bit register component, I don't actually have to call my footer component by import footer from footer slash footer by calling this uh, particular uh, folder to access my footer.jx, I don't have to call all of this on my bit.js. Instead, I just can call one function, one uh, component, one function, one file that is in the JX and access all uh, whatever component I want from this. So it's just will uh, collect all your imports of component in one particular file. If you want to access any component anywhere, all you have to do is call this index.js anywhere, and you can access all these components by just calling the name that you give here. This your name it could be anything here. By just calling this name, you can access this particular component. That is what export model means. So for example, I'm accessing this index.js uh, here. Let me say, let me show you how I access this one. Here, all I have to do is I call in my components folder index, I just call it here, and all these components, I just call their name. Now I can automatically access all the components functionalities by just uh, use calling their name. That's what I did. So it's just minimize uh, the imports that you will be calling to import functions. So yeah. in normal case, in a basic level uh, programmer, you will have to call import header from slash at component slash header slash header .jx. I have to import everything, which is a lot of line to call each single component here. But using by because I include in index.js all my exports, I just have to call one particular file to access almost 10 components. So this is a best practice to have in React application. Uh, the other concept would be proper use of a AS Lint and Prepare. These are package you can install on the React. Their purpose is, let's say, uh, more than 10 or uh, it doesn't matter, more than one developer is working on your React application. So you, everyone is pushing their changes on the React application. So, so one user, one developer can choose to make 
some kind of styling on the React application, and the other developer can implement its own styling. Let's say if we have five developers, five developers can uh, style your app, the same one project in different ways, which can be messy, really messy and not constant when you are working with a group of developers. So this is the uh, AS link and prettier package will give a fixed configuration for the application. So once you uh, fixed your styling, one fixed file, using these two packets it could be one of them not you don't have to do apply both of them they are different packets uh, so once you specify on your configuration for my entire application i want this font i want this color for headings i want this color for paragraphs you will specify your specification in one particular file and you will push it to your project so any developer who decide to style it again in that particular configuration will automatically get an error. It will not let pass you. So when you doing a group project like this one and everyone is doing a uh, change to affect the user interface, if you specify your configuration right, it will not let them. Anyone will not be let them to go out of that configuration. So that's what the purpose of these two are. These are, these are just configurations like packing your JSON. You will have an LSP file hit there. You will specify all your styles uh, you, you want to have on your application, permanent styles. So no matter what kind of developer is pushing their work on your React application, that particular configuration will not then will, will not let them uh, to change your work so they have to go to the configuration and change it but they cannot change it the normal way so this is what the purpose of slt and prettier does they can give a permanent configuration for all your styles for react application uh, the third concept is ternary operators so for example here if you can see here so i can use uh, if the state is true, I'm telling it to display the dashboard uh, component. If it's not, I'm telling it to display the sign up component. So this is why right. you can do this, but it's not a best practice. And instead of using this, these two have the same result. At the end of the day, they have the same result, but you can use to display this writing with this kind of writing, which is called ternary operators. That is using the question mark in the colon, you can uh, do the condition of if else, like this one. This is just a syntax and how you write uh, this kind of if statements with ternary operators. And this uh, best practice is much minimize the code line, uh, it's more attractive to read and to see, right? Than this one, it's just a lot of lines. This is with one line, you can put your condition, which is play something if some condition is met by this one. So using ternary operators way of writing uh, is much, it's a best, a best practice than using this one. So this is a beginner level. Now you guys are going to the intermediate or advanced based on your skills and you should use ternary operators. Uh, the other will be import order. So in re, uh, there is uh, not a rule, but a best practice how you should import on your, uh, things on your component, React component. So here, if you can see it, I have a component, I have a package that I'm importing. This is the components, the package, right? I'm importing this package. Uh, this is a prototype, a built-in in React, are built-in packages or library that are that you find when you install React application. Uh, here, the colors and the image, I'm importing them from another component uh, that I created in my application. So how you should order them? I mean, I, could, I can choose to put this one on the first and this one on the second and this one on the last. But there is a best practice that suggests it's better to put the building imports first, the external imports, that is package that you install and importing on the second level, and internal imports, that is calling uh, another functionality that you created somewhere in your application, 
the last this is considered a best practice which you can implement on your so all built-in functionalities when you import them you should put them on the first order all packages that you return for your raft application you will put them next and last all your import within your application can be should be put on the last this is just a best practice it's not wrong to mix them up but it's just considered uh, a best practice so that's the, uh, the fifth concept that I want to mention is destructuring. So destructuring is a concept you need to know in, uh, in, in calling functionalities on anything. It's just destructuring, I think, also exists in Python. It exists in, I think it's, it's a JavaScript concept. I'm not sure on Python, but in JavaScript, destructuring is a, is a critical concept you need to grasp on. So you can call, let's say I have a user object and that user object has a name and age and a professional values. I can call this user object like this in my React application. This is okay, you can do that, but it's not going to see a best practice. And instead you can use the uh, object destructuring functionality. And first before uh, passing them to the React HTML DOM element, you first destructure all the values that are found on the user object. Here I'm destructuring it, which means I'm uh, fetching all the data that are existed on the user object. So uh, like this, and all I have to do is just call those name, age, profession like this to display it in my React app. So it will display the age, the name, the profession of that user like this. This is considered a best practice to implement when you write your uh, DOM element or your React component to fetch some data uh, from an object. You should destructure first, then pass the value to the React HTML part. What are other things you should include? Uh, your naming, your component naming should be meaningful. You shouldn't just name any word. If you are creating a form for, for user registration, you should name it say user registration instead of saying some other thing that you that only be understood by you should be able to be understood by other developers, other users. So your component name should be meaningful. You should break down components. So in one component, technically you can include any type of, I mean, any amount of functionality. In one component, I can choose to put a sign up functionality, a login functionality, a fetching functionality, a storing functionality. I mean, there is no limit how much uh, to, to the amount of functionality you could put in one single component. You have that option to do that. You can do that. You can do that. But that's not considered a best practice. The best practice is to break down your components uh, and actually the best practice is one component should only work for one functionality you shouldn't include more than one functionality in one component it's just it decreases its readability its accessibility for other developers so the one function the if one functionality is only included in one component the better your core quality is the better your coding is so you should break down your components. If you have different functionality, you should put some in different components instead of just gathering them in one component. Use the structuring, the concept that I just mentioned now. Uh, use component small. This is the same concept that I took right now. Use prop types. Uh, this is the uh, pass information between a parent component, each other component. You should use React functionality prop. React has this, actually a lot of front-end frameworks have the prop functionality, which lets you to pass data between a parent component and a, a child component. So when I say parent component, there is a component and you are accessing another component inside another component. So the one that's accepting another component inside of it is a parent component and that one coming in the in the parent component is named a child component. So if I want to pass an information 
from the parent to the child component, I use the prop type functional to free up to pass the, the data. So you should use that instead of uh, repeating, for example, if I'm fetching a data from a database, I have a function fetching that particular data from a database. I don't have to call that function twice on the parent or on the user. If I call it on the parent, that's enough. As I get the data, I can pass it to the child component as a prop. The child component will automatically will fetch the data. I hope you get it. So you should use a prop type functionality of React. Use functional component. Avoid inline style when you install your React uh, components. It's a best practice to avoid inline styles. Instead, you should put your styles in separate files and access your styling from there. Use arrow functions instead of using the normal way of writing functional functions. You should use arrow functions, stateless components, spread operators to list objects, values. If you're new to that, you can read up on them, but these are advisable concepts to include. On as a, these are considered as a best practice on your React application. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to mention on React is like always, testing is important. So you need to have a testing on React. So what does it mean to test a React application? You start from unit tests. That is testing your each, if you have 10 components that do different purpose, each component should be tested first. That we call unit testing. Each component, each page functionality need to have a unit test. The second would be integration. So if I have a connection between components, now I have to integrate, I have to make an integration connection a test to see all the connections that I made by you know, on these components are working as they should, what we call integration testing. The last one would be E to E test, which is testing the entire application. So this, uh, you have to write an algorithm to test each component to make an integration. Uh, when you uh, install a React application by default, uh, it depends on wh which mechanism you are using to install React application. But if you go you install a React application based on the React documentation, uh, there's a built-in testing. Just it use a build. It will install for you a built-in testing package that is just in testing library. Uh, you don't have to install additional uh, testing tool. So if it does include the just testing when you react, when you install it, you just use that one. There's a lot of tutorials how you can uh, test your React application with just a testing, uh, testing library package. So it's okay. So if, if, if uh, your React application, the way you install it doesn't include these two packages, you have to install them. But I am guessing it will likely you will have the package will be installed automatically when you install a React application. All you have to do is do the testing. So on your, on the file, you will put dot test, then the React application will uh, detect it as a testing function. So I'm going to show you this one as well. Uh, here, references, I have put a lot of references for best practices, tutorials, you can refer. Uh, let me just show you here on the testing part. So here, for example, I'm uh, implement, I implemented just testing. Uh, all I have to do is, because the app applications that I installed for the particular application already installed for me, they just uh, in test library package. So all I have to do is just put dot test dot js. I'm using JavaScript, so dot test dot js and the app application will automatically understand it as this is my testing for this particular component. Here I'm testing the add input component. Uh, I think if you know Mocha Chai testing, it's uh, in Python, it has the same kind of uh, way of writing the testing. You, It's easy to understand. But uh, uh, I would recommend you to, to see tutorial. All you have to do is just here I'm testing my input field. I'm calling it uh, here. I'm calling my um, 
JavaScript element to test the input field from my input uh, component. I can test a button I, to see if it is actually working. I can test all my, if I have a form to accept some kind of information, I can pass uh, mock values and see if it actually stores to the database. So this kind of testing you can do on your React application. What else is there? But, um, there, uh, I can show you the versioning part, a demo. This is for all React. So you can implement this to improve your React application. Let's see the versioning part if you don't see it here. I'm using Fast API. So uh, once you install Fast API, we pip install Fast API. Uh, Fast API has this API router library that you can use. So I, all I have to do is import that particular library. I have these two functions that fetch user's information. In the first one, I have given the user's in mind point slash user's route. And uh, here, using the API router, I decided to create two versions for my REST API in the point. So I uh, initialized the value here for my first version and my second one like this. So for my first endpoint, I pass my version one variable as a decorator and it's specified like this. So uh, uh, this in this particular demo, I'm, I have, I'm not connected with the database. So I'm just gonna output some work I'm saying list all users. So when this particular endpoint is clicked, this is the response. Now, let's say I decided I have a different way of uh, getting users' information from a database. So forget this one. Now my user, I have an application where the users are just using this particular endpoint to access all users. So instead of just putting them in maintenance mode until I fix, uh, I implement a new way of fetching users. I'll create another version with the same endpoint, and I make sure this one get the decorator version to variable. So here I have implemented, so here I decided to uh, output for this case, to display the output in different words, since I'm not connected. But just consider for your case you have this idea to fetch users in different way than the first uh, the first way of fetching the data and you decided to implement that and you did implement that and what after implementing these two versions by different mechanism assume that all i have to do uh, is here using the include router function of the fast api i'm telling it if the decorate is version v1 add a prefix v1 before the endpoint and if it is version 2 functionality is that's been called make sure to add a prefix version 2. now i can I already run it so let's just see what it looks like with the endpoint this is my two routes so it displayed the first user's endpoint by adding a version 1 my URL and the second one as my version two URL. So both two work. This is how you can do versioning using Fast API. So they both can work and just uh, output the values of, as they should. The version two do the same thing. So without stopping your application from you working, you can implement new changes on your REST API. It on user from the database. So this is, uh, I just want to show you a little demo how you can do versioning on your REST API. Okay, so it's time for question time. Uh, is it clear? Yeah. Do um, you have any question? You have a question? Yeah, Joseph. Uh, what's, what's in the folder okay. users? Uh, for in folder? Your... Uh, yeah, in the folder users, is it your API key? Uh, are the in your Python uh, in your are version? We on your the or are we on the this one here? Yeah, yeah. 
this is a uh, endpoint slash users i'm just there's no folder i'm just uh, yeah the file yet which file the file, what's in the file the users the in that file in that in that users file is it uh no this is, is not a file? file yeah this is not a file this is an endpoint uh okay. naming okay. i'm saying uh so if you go to the endpoint here yeah this is a uh, users part you will see so i can this is my route url right so slash users will fetch me the endpoint okay. slash users you, you okay, know right I, in your endpoint url this is my endpoint yeah, definition I, yeah i understand uh, another question is uh um why is all this necessary if i may ask if uh, the so, api design this is for the front end yes for, for front end and back end api design is for the back end okay okay and the api is how we'll interact with the interface yeah the api is how you interact with the you connect with your front end and access data from the database so the purpose is when you include this kind of conditions or this kind of stage on your rest your api design you're making your api design much better so for example, I said here, for example, security slash here, I put slash users uh, endpoint right here. So this particular endpoint can be accessed by anyone. Let's say you are building this application, which accepts maybe, I don't know, many from users or ask, ask uh, yeah, yeah, let's say it accepts uh, many from users. There are applications that accepts uh, like shopping carts and everything like that. So if uh maybe no yeah let's say shopping cart or some application where when a user wins something or do something you pass a money to them and if you let that user it's a particular endpoint vulnerable without putting any security hackers or other kind of people can easily access your endpoint and trigger some functionality on your application and access all that money to their account so the purpose is when the more you make your api design much better on how you secure it test it um i don't know all this point that i mentioned right uh, till now you you're making your uh, request calling to your backend more secure and more good in, in its performance so we, I'm showing you this all concepts because you have to have, you are working to be a better developer, right? So for that purpose, you have to know these key points to improve your skills on this particular area. So for this big project, you might not get to be more secure as uh, uh, secure. It might not be that much required, but if you go to the business world, you have to consider every considerations because your endpoint should not be able vulnerable to attacks because the endpoints are the way to at, to access your database to access any kind of thing on the back the endpoints are responsible for that so you need to make them you need to design them carefully so they they shouldn't they shouldn't be transparent for others to be accessed because there is a lot of people out there that is the whole yeah. point why you are understood yeah understood thank you any other question? Okay, is it clear or you can give me a reaction if it's clear? We don't have, we can end the tutorial. Okay, wait. Okay, so uh, thank you. And you can uh, forward on the Slack. I'll share the slide on the drive. Okay, I'm going to end the.